Good afternoon, Gertens Gardeners, and welcome to another session. My name is Karen, and I'm coming to you live from another portion of one of my favorite places here on Gertens Lot. This is our fountain area. We're out here on our south lot, our tropical lot, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about fountains. As you can see, I'm surrounded by one of um, some of uh, one of the sets of some of our absolutely gorgeous fountains here at Gertens today. It's a beautiful early summer day here in Minnesota, and what more perfect day uh, for fountains. Uh, fountains are a gorgeous addition to your summer garden. They add beauty, they add sound, they add light in some cases. Uh, they add interest to our wildlife. Our wildlife loves the, the fresh water source and all of that moving water. And of course, evaporation is a cooling process, right? So it also helps to cool your sitting area if you have a fountain or two nearby. In fact, I'm feeling quite relaxed and breezy out here. I've got a lovely summer breeze and all of this cooling water. It's just a fantastic day to be out here. So I'm gonna be fielding your questions about our fountains today. Um, and the first thing that I'd like to talk about while we wait for some of you to get online and ask your questions is some basics about what you need to have a fountain in your garden. So the first thing after you've chosen your fountain is you want to make sure that you have an electrical source. All of our fountains are run by direct plug-in. We don't have any solar powered fountains. So you want to make sure that you have access to a GFCI outdoor outlet somewhere in the vicinity of your fountain. Most of our fountains here at Gertens do have long electrical cords so you can get that out to your uh, GFCI outlet uh, but you do want to make sure that you have something that is weather safe that's water safe because of course there's a lot of water outdoors not just in the fountain itself but all of our our summer storms and things so you need to make sure you're running safe electricity um, directly to your fountain the second thing that you need is you're going to have to have a nice flat level surface to place your fountain on. Water is extremely heavy, it's eight pounds per gallon, and then you've got the actual weight of the fountain itself. All of our fountains are concrete, which means that they're quite heavy, they're very stable, which means they're probably not going anywhere unless it's a very, very, very heavy wind situation. Um, but that also means that they're going to need to sit on a nice firm level surface. So if you are putting in a fountain for the first time, consider placing it perhaps on a, uh, an already done nice level decking surface or a patio. If you don't have that, then the best thing to do is to dig up a small area, um, just you know a couple inches deep, make yourself a nice little box or circle, and then put patio um, paver sand into that area. And then you're going to put a few paver stones on it, tap it with a rubber mallet to get it nice and level, check it with your level, make sure all of your four corners are sitting nice and flat. And then you have a perfect um, situation to put your brand new fountain down. Once your fountain is in a level area, it will flow nice and evenly. You won't have any water coming off of just one spot. So that's probably the second most important thing to think about siding wise. The third one, is up above me here, sunshine. So um, sun is wonderful, it feels fantastic. Our plants need it a lot, but one thing that happens when you combine sunshine with water is you get algae. Um, so a lot of people struggle with algae and staining in their fountains. So it's a wise idea to try to site your fountain if possible out of most of the midday to late afternoon sun. Um, the more sun we can keep off of our fountains, the less likely we are to have that algae build up and have to fight staining. How do you clean that? <coughs> so if you do end up with staining, which does happen with fountains over time, there are a few things that you can do. First of all, you're going to drain out all that old um, water. You're going to pick out all of your debris from your fountain. And you wanna do that on a pretty regular basis because all of that organic matter breaks down in the water and that can lead to more different kinds of staining. And then take some Dawn soap and a scrubby, exactly the same kind you use inside your house to wash your dishes. You can just scrub the surface of your concrete with your scrubby and your Dawn soap. Use your hose to hose it off. If you have further staining that a little bit of elbow grease and scratching with your Dawn soap is not getting off, you can use a gentle hydrogen peroxide solution, <coughs> pardon me, or you can use 
a concrete bird bath and fountain cleaner that is um, specifically formulated to help you clean staining off of concrete. How do you stop water from evaporating? Okay, so evaporation is a natural process. It happens on hot days. It also can happen with wind. The wind can blow the water out of your fountain and lead to more water loss. Um, there are only a couple things you can do. Number one, again, cite your fountain out of the sun. The less heat means the less evaporation. It's just a scientific process, right? So if we can get our fountains out of that hot, sunny weather, we're going to have less evaporation. We can cite our fountains on the eastern side of our property or behind some trees, which blocks the wind. So you're not getting as much wind loss as the wind sweeps the water out of the fountain. So trying to cite your fountain in an area with less wind, less um, sunshine is going to really help you to get um, a nice, as, as much water to stay in your fountain as possible. So we're going to take a look at another one of our, you can see it's a beautiful windy day out here. I'm probably having some water blowing out of my fountains here at Gertens. We're going to go ahead and take a look at one of my other fountain areas. <coughs> this is my fountain grotto, as I like to call it. This is our... Yes, absolutely. Cheryl, Cheryl is asking, are they connected to a water source or just filled up? Yes, so Cheryl, all of our fountains are actually what we call a recirculating system. That means that the water itself is in an enclosed system. It sits in the basin of the fountain and it just gets pumped through to the top of the fountain and then back out again and back into that basin. So it's basically just making a continuous loop there's no direct plumbing involved in any of our fountains. You can fill them with a garden hose, you can fill them with a bucket, but you do not need to have a water line directly to your fountain in order to get it to run. Are there any chemicals you use? So there are some chemicals you can choose to use. Um, one of the things that our manufacturer recommends against is actually chlorine. So a lot of times we'll use chlorine in our swimming pools to protect our water that we are playing in and swimming in from um, picking up bacteria and stuff, which is wonderful for swimming pools. <coughs> but with fountains, uh, you want to actually stay away from chlorine because it can change and it can dye the um, stains of your fountain. So if you look at all of our fountains, every single one of them is actually a stained concrete or a painted concrete. Um, and it has a special finish on it. None of them are just raw concrete because raw concrete actually absorbs water. So if you use chlorine products, that can actually bleach your fountain and ruin your finish. So you want to avoid that. Um, you can use an anti-algicide in your water to prevent some of that algae growth. If you do want to site your fountain in a warm, sunny location, you do want to make sure you pick something that's animal friendly though, because our little feathered friends and all of the neighborhood animals are going to definitely use your fountain as a water source. Deborah asks, do you have Lyme issues? Do we have Lyme issues? Oh my goodness, Deborah, do we ever? So we actually draw our water directly from our local water table here at Gertens. It is not filtered. It is not sent through any kind of cleaning facility. It's just directly up from the ground and out to our plants and our fountains. So I have a lot of Lyme scale issues with my fountains. And what we do for that is we actually use a little bit of vinegar, diluted vinegar, and it's usually what we use is we use a solution of one half cup household vinegar to one half gallon of water. And I just take a sponge and I dip my sponge in that vinegar solution and I rub my sponge against those hard water stains and it just melts them away. The acid just gets rid of all that lime for me. Cheryl asks, how do you protect over winter? Oh, that's a great question, Cheryl. So um, as we know, Minnesota is not conducive to running water in the wintertime. It's not a thing that happens. So what you want to do as we hit about November and we're getting into a really cold, chilly weather is we're going to go ahead and we're going to drain our fountain. We're going to take all of our electrical pieces, if that's lights, that's the plumbing, all of our pumps, it's all going to come inside. And then the best practice, if you can, is actually to move your concrete fountain, once it's dried out, inside to your garage. Now, some of our bigger fountains, probably not very practical to move a fountain such as this beauty, beauty right here into the garage. So what you're going to do is you're going to drain it out. You're going to remove all of the water. Again, take your, your pump inside for the winter. 
you're going to towel dry it, make sure that all of the water has been removed, and then you're actually going to buy a fountain cover directly from the manufacturer. In this case, this is a Campania fountain. Campania sells fountain covers directly for its fountains, and you're going to take that cover, you're going to bring it over the fountain, you're going to tie it off at the base, make sure that no uh, snow or rain or ice gets into your fountain over the winter, and then come the warm weather, you can uncover your fountain, hook it back up with its plumbing, and it's ready to go again. Wow. <laughs> All right, and um, as we stand out here with these fountains, how much noise do they make? I'm assuming that the larger ones make the most noise. Right. So it's actually kind of deceptive, the noise making that a fountain can make. So it's actually not necessarily about the size of the fountain, but the fall of the water. So on a, a fountain like my little elephant right here, it just has a teeny tiny little fall and it's just going to make a tiny little burbly sound because the water doesn't have that much where to go. It's just kind of trickling right over. There's just a tiny little bit of water movement there. But if you look at this fountain over here, this is kind of like your faucet in your kitchen or your, your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink. You can see that there's a big, huge fall to this fountain. It's not a very large fountain, but the amount of noise that it puts out because there's that water dropping into a basin far below actually creates a ton of falling noise. So the larger the fall of the water, the more sound you're creating. And of course, the more the water is dispersed along a surface, the softer it's going to be. So even though this water is way above on this basin here, it's following the finial the entire way down. There's just not that much noise on this particular one. <clears throat> what would be the um, fountain that you would recommend for someone just starting this sort of Process. Yeah, so if you want to kind of get into fountains, but you don't want to, you know, really, you're worried about upkeep and all that kind of stuff, I recommend working with a smaller fountain, something like this little guy right here. Um, it's a fairly low price one. I think he's about $300. It's very simple. There isn't a lot of pieces. So it's just the jar. It's the top of the finial, and then the pump sits inside. So it's very easy to take care of. It's super easy to dry out in the winter. You just bring that little guy into the garage, or if you want, you need a little um, sounds of summer in your winter time, you can even bring him inside and put him on the kitchen table and you know have a little bit of water movement over the winter time. So a small fountain that's fairly movable is actually a great starter if you feel a little bit intimidated by some, some of these larger, fancier pieces. How much electricity do some of these fountains take? So actually, fountain pumps are extremely low draw pieces of electrical equipment. Um, they, they only are drawing a few amps at a time. It's not a very expensive process as far as the electrical is concerned. So in fact, if you look at my pavilion here, I have pretty much almost all of my fountains turned on. And um, we actually just had a consultation with our electrician. He's like, it's fine. There's hardly any draw on the circuit. I'm not worried about it at all. So I, here I have probably 15 fountains plugged in and it's barely a stress on the circuit at all. Does the location of outdoor fountains affect how easy it is to maintain? So it certainly can affect how easy a fountain is to maintain. For instance, if you have sited your fountain in an area where it's getting a lot of debris blown into it, if you have it near flowering plants where the petals are always kind of blowing into your fountain, you've got leaves that are blowing in there, maybe somebody's out cutting the grass and the grass clippings are blowing into the fountain, that's going to be a lot more maintenance than if you have it sited, say, in a patio area where you're not going to get all that debris. The main thing with fountain maintenance is actually getting the debris out of the fountain. Um, that's the main thing. So you can see, like with this guy, if I scoop my hand in here, there's going to be there's going to be some goo that I'm going to be pulling out. There's definitely little flotsam and jetsam that just kind of fall into the fountain. And you're having to remove that on a fairly regular basis. I recommend at least weekly or more if you can get to it. Cheryl asks, do you have any upcoming sales on these? So generally our sales tend to be on the fountains. Um, they're going to be... Let's take a trip over Yes. 
Um, they're probably going to be coming up late in the, in the summer. So we usually don't see the fountains going on sale until probably mid to late July, but it's really up to company ownership and somewhat to uh, how well I do my job of selling them. So um, hopefully um, we will be seeing all of our fountains going to wonderful new homes here shortly. And there probably won't be very many left for our summer sale if they choose to place them on sale. But we have no planned sales for our fountains at this time. So what's, what are some of your favorite fountains? Oh gosh, um, actually one of my favorites is right over here. I love the Polynesian style. We have this beautiful kind of tropical vacation um, theme going over here and this little tiki man, I think he's absolutely charming. Um, he's just a little Polynesian tiki head. He has a little light in him. He doesn't make a lot of noise, but I think he is just utterly delightful. He's just a sweet little fountain. Um, I tend to like some of our more traditional fountains as well. Things just kind of catch my eye. I love the leaf style of this Henry fountain right here. Um, very natural with while still being kind of statuesque. This is a beautiful fountain and all of the Henry fountains, um, they're just spectacular. They're gorgeous, gorgeous. They're put together beautifully. They run beautifully. Um, the fine details, the carving in, in the bases, everything is just exquisite. So as you can see, as we've been taking this little tour, probably about a third of the fountains total have lights. Some of our fountain manufacturers tend to put more lights on their fountains than others. So for instance, with our Henry fountains, like these two here, um, probably a good three quarters of their fountain, uh, their fountains actually do come with lights. Whereas some of the other ones, maybe about a third of those fountains come with lights. So certainly there are some lit options if that appeals to you. Cheryl asks again, are there ones birds prefer? Yeah, so Cheryl, just like with the rest of um, when you're picking out a bird bath, birds like the sound of running water and they like shallow water that they feel safe in. So they don't like deep bowls, they don't like deep wells. They want something shallow that they can perch in without drowning, right? Because they're just little guys. So you probably want to look for a, a fountain that's more bird bath shaped, kind of a shallow dish. Um, you know, probably not more than about six inches at the max deep. So some of our fountains that we were just looking at back in our fountain grotto back there um, would be ideal for our little feathered friends. And they really do love, love, love to play in fountains that are active. They'll bathe in them, they'll drink from them. Um, and it's just really a wonderful way to bring more um, bird watching into your yard. For the running water, would you recommend turning them off? At night or when you're away? Yeah, so <clears throat> running fountains, the, the most important thing that you have to look out for is your fountain itself running dry because this is a closed water system. Um, if the fountain does run down to the point where the pump can't push any water through, it can actually burn out. So it's very important to keep an eye on your water level. For some people, that means they're going to turn them off at night or they're going to turn them off on a windy day. I actually have mine on a remote, on an outdoor plug-in remote so that I can turn it on when I want it on and I can easily turn it off from the comfort of my sofa when I don't want it on. If the wind starts to pick up or I'm going to bed for night, I just click my remote and it turns right off. And we do sell um, outdoor remote systems. I know we have them in the winter. We may even have some in our lawn and garden uh, area right now. So if someone does want to purchase a fountain, <coughs> how do about that here at Hertz? So if you are going to be purchasing a fountain, if you've seen something on the video that you're in love with today, please find myself or one of the Pottery staff members. Let us know which fountain you're interested in and we're going to go ahead and get you set up with your fountain. We're going to put the fountain on a cart. We're going to deliver you over to our checkouts and we're going to have our carryouts, our fantastic carryout staff load the fountain right into your vehicle. Now, if you want something like this, this guy's a very large fountain. Maybe you have a smaller vehicle. Maybe you don't have room for him, but you want to bring him home. We also offer delivery so we can get you out to um, our staff to set up delivery. Delivery is a fee based on zip code. So it's going to range, you know, probably somewhere anywhere in the range of 75 to $200. And if you have something very heavy, there might be a forklift fee. It just really depends on your specific location in the Twin Cities as to how much that delivery is going to cost. There's no set fee for that, but there, that's always an option. All right. Looks like we've got people looking already.
right? Yes, <laughs> fantastic. So let's go back over to our other area. Yes. <clears throat> Do you have any recommendations? Once we get over here, we can talk about Yes, it. absolutely. Yeah, so think, think a lot about where are you going to be spending your time outside. Um, a fountain is only enjoyable if you're there to enjoy it. So make sure you're citing your fountain where you can see it, where you can hear it, um, whether that is by a patio that you like to spend time with, whether it's in your favorite part of your garden bed, which is where mine is, um, or perhaps right by a window in your living room so you can open the window up and stare out the window and look at your fountain and hear that wonderful um, noise coming and just relaxing you with a you know with a nice beverage inside and the air conditioning you know be thoughtful about where you're going to get the most enjoyment out of your fountain and if that means <clears throat> that you're putting it in a little bit more sunshine you know the important thing is really that you're enjoying your fountain so how do you measure what size fountain you should have you may have answered this earlier right so when you're thinking about your fountain you really want to think about the space that you're putting it are you considering putting it on a tabletop on your patio? Well, then you want something little. Is it going to be out in the front as a centerpiece to your home? Then you want to think about, <clears throat> you know, if you have a smaller ranch size home, you might want something that is fancy but not too big. If you have a large three-story home, maybe you want our, our grand um, double-tier fountain that we have in our grotto. So make sure that you're being thoughtful about the proportion of your home versus the fountain that you purchase and the area that you're putting it in. Um, a lot of times people will think about, okay, this is my spot. They may take some measurements and think about where they can place their, their flat surface so that it's nice and level. And then how much space do they have? Are the plants that are going to be next to the fountain, are they gonna overgrow the fountain? Are they gonna look too big? So, you know, think about proportion, what's near your fountain and what's going to look um, correct in your spot. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? If we don't have any other questions. All right. Thank you so much for joining us all today, Gertens Gardeners. If you have any other questions, I will be on the Facebook feed later today. I will be answering any other questions that you have. I'm happy to do it. And I look forward to seeing you out on our Gertens lot. Thanks so much for coming, everyone.